Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's join the meeting today. Uh, this is a masterclass to uh, go through the key technical financial covenants of rope PPPs in India. Uh, it, it's a one hour class, so we will discuss about what are the various contractual models for rope PPPs, what are the technical considerations and overview of the technical uh, components that are there in the rope PPP projects. And then the key financial considerations going till the financial modeling consideration. So how uh, even although these are ham based projects, how they are different from road PPP projects. Uh, so uh, briefly about the state of play, uh, road for PPPs is indeed a growing opportunity in India. So uh, this slide shows some of the articles uh, about the new projects that have been launched. So a very promising start in India. Uh, this sector has been prevalent in the Indian economy for a very long time, but uh, now under the Parvat Mala scheme, a lot of focus has been made uh, for new roadway PPP projects uh, across all the states, especially in hilly terrains. So what are the advantages of roadway PPPs? Uh, so th this is an article which has been published by the government of India itself, wherein they talk about the Parvat Mala scheme uh, and what are the major fact factors that drive the ropeways infrastructure in India. So starting from it's a cost friendlier transportation. So uh, especially for hilly terrains wherein the roads have to be made in a circular motion, uh, these can be made in a straight line over a hilly terrain, resulting in lower land acquisition cost. Also, it has lower construction maintenance costs, lower chances of accidents if all the proper technical uh, standards have been followed and far more superior to narrow gauge railroads. So they are superior both in both from roads as well as railroad railroads in these hilly terrains. Time saver, yes, being in aerial mode, roadways take lesser time than roadways. Nature friendly, lower emissions, uh, Material containers can be designed to take out any soiling of the environment and last mile connectivity. So it can transport a large number of passengers around 6,000 to 8,000 passengers per hour by adopting a 3S. So we will talk about what 3S is in the next slides, but this is a kind of a technology uh, which is used for ropeway PVPs and it can transport a larger number of passengers compared to the earlier technologies. So in terms of technical overview, so what are the three types of technologies that are prevalent for ropeway PPPs uh, across the world? So one is MDG or what we call as monocable detachable gondolas. The second is BDG, bi-cable detachable gondolas and 3S or tri-cable detachable gondolas. Uh, so MDG as the name suggests, uh, this right now across the globe is the most common ropeway system because this is one of the cheapest way to do a ropeway. Uh, they have been installed in cities in uh, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Algeria, England, Singapore and Brazil. And what you see the figure, this is an Emirates airline in London, which is a simple two station MDG system that crosses the Thames River in London. So this is a tourist attraction there. Uh, similarly, by cable, uh, when uh, so this has again two cables as the name suggests and originally they had superior wind capability wind stability and they could reach higher speeds than the mdg counterparts however now because of advancement in mdg and the lowering of cost of 3s so there are two factors mdg the technology has improved similarly 3s the cost has decreased so that's why mdg systems are not no longer being developed it's very rare that you come across these systems now uh, so one example is that uh, when when the singapore cable car was introduced in uh, 90 1990s it was introduced in a bdg system but when uh, it was refurbished and there was a complete overhaul done and then it was changed to an mdg system now the third one is 3s which is called Tri cable. Uh, this comes from a German word, Presidil, which means tri cable. And it was developed initially by a Swiss company, uh, Von Roll Transport Systems, 
uh, which denied the benefits of gondola lift to those of a reversible cable car system. So again, this is one of the examples, which is in Canada. Uh, this is one of the most, uh, uh, this is one of the system which has the highest length and it is one of the most high profile 3S systems ever built. So going into a little bit more, more details about these three kinds of technologies. So in MDG, across all the three, as the name suggests, these are all detachable, meaning uh, the gondolas will detach from the cable car for boarding and deboarding uh, of the passengers, and then they can be detached, uh, attached again to the ropeway system so that then they can transport the passengers. So in terms of cables, as MDG has a single cable, which provides both support and propulsion, a BDG has two cables, which provides one of them, which provides a support and the second, which provides a propulsion. And 3S has three cables, uh, two for support and one for propulsion. Talking about the speed, so MDG, uh, the speed for the system is around six meters per second, which is equivalent to 22 kilometers per hour. And there are certain projects which have gone up to seven meters per second. A detachable is around seven to 7.5 meters per second, which is equivalent to uh, 25 to 27 kilometer per hour and uh, 3S, uh, there are speeds which can reach up to 32, 35 kilometers per hour as well or anywhere above 7.5 to 8.5 meters per second. So of course, these are much higher speed systems compared to MDG. In terms of capacity, so uh, MDG typically the gondola that you see that would carry around eight to 10 passengers uh, per car, so around two to three thousand uh, pphpd. So this terminology that you see, uh, pphpd, is a terminology very common to the ropeway industry or the cable car industry, wherein this stands for people or passengers, basically passengers per hour per direction or people per hour per direction. So it can be used interchangeably. So ppp pphpd is the terminology that would define the capacity of any cable car system. So uh, MDG is around 8 to 10 passengers, detachable is 8 to 17 people, and 3S, which has larger cable cars, can carry around 35 passengers each. So uh, giving a capacity of 6,000 to 8,000 people per hour per direction. Now, in terms of towers, so both MDG and BDG have cylindrical towers, which are typically concrete towers that you would see at the end of the uh, at the ropeway station. Whereas for 3S, you have, would have large lattice shaped towers. So these are the towers which are very similar, which looks very similar to transmission lines, transmission line towers, which are constructed out of concrete or uh, steel and uh, have a lattice shape. And we will see that in the next slide as well. Uh, costing wise, uh, MDG is around 5 to 20 million per kilometer. So uh, the range is quite wide depending on the location. Uh, uh, BDG as 15 to 25 and detachable 3S is around uh, 10 to 24. So as you can see now, what has happened over the past was earlier when 3S was not there, this, this costing of 3S was used to be around 30 to 40 million per kilometer. But now with advancement, the cost have really reduced for 3S systems and the technology has improved from MDG systems as well. So that's that's the reason why BDG is now very rare. <clears throat> Almost, uh, especially in Asia, people either go for MDG or 3S. Uh, BDG is not very preferred now. Um, So this is what uh, this is a little bit more detail about a 3S system, what it looks like. So as I said, these are the lattice shaped towers that you would see, uh, which has weather instruments, hoisting frame, profile being track ropes and haul rope. So uh, it's good to know a little bit more details about these technical uh, components for a ropeway system because these are really the inputs for the financial feasibility or the financial model that are being prepared uh, for these projects. So it's good to get that BOQ done or the EPC cost component. And that's why, you know, it, it's good to understand these things. And then you have the cable car. So this is how a cable car looks like for urban 3S systems, which is more like a metro that you would see, which has bucket shaped seats, uh, larger cabins. You can move around the cabin as well. They are ample handrails. So this is one of the designs for a 3S gondola. Um, so uh, just some details about uh, 
the lattice tower, or it's also called a truss tower, which is a freestanding vertical framework tower. Uh, as I said, the construction is widely used in transmission towers, uh, carrying high voltage transmission lines, radio mast and observation towers. So you'd come across those towers very often. Uh, 3S, as I mentioned, is ideal for cities. Uh, these are high speed, high capacity systems uh, that are elevated and have a small footprint. Uh, and built in uh, 2010, uh, the first 3S system to showcase the urban concept uh, was in Germany, uh, which, as I said, this is that photograph, which is designed to look like a cabin uh, with a large seating capacity, uh, wherein the features include bucket seats, uh, bike racks, etc. And uh, it's very similar to a metro or a urban bus. The same feeling that you would get here. OK, and uh, so in now all the roadway PPPs that are being done in India, they are being done as 3S systems and uh, or they are four major players across the globe who have this technology with which the Indian developers are also expected to sign some kind of an OEM contract or an MOU so that these systems can be operated. So these are the major ones that you would see. These are Doppelmayr. It was formed in 20, 2002 uh, when uh, Doppelmayr of Austria merged with Graventa. So they, they were two. This, this is now called Doppelmayr or Graventa Group out of Switzerland. Uh, it, initially, uh, it was founded in 1892. So that was the founding. And then in 20, 2002, they merged together, Graventa and Doppelmayr. And now they are called as Doppelmayr. That's the name. The other one is Leitner Ropeways. So it was founded in 1888 and was recognized in 2003 to be owned by Leitner Group. And now it's part of the HDI Group. Uh, it manufactures and distributes products and equipment for ropeways, snow groomers, urban transportation systems, and wind energy as well in Italy and in international markets. And then you have the Poma Group, which is the French company which manufactures cable driven lift systems, uh, chair lifts, gondola lifts. Uh, aerial tramways and surface lifts. So primarily a lift manufacturer, which has now gone into rope systems as well. Uh, in 2000, Poma became part of the Leitner Group. Now, uh, essentially what has happened uh, for these three companies is Leitner and Poma. They both are now part of a group called HDI Group. So they remain independent companies, but they are part of the HDI Group and all the supply chain procurement is through a strategic partnership which includes combined purchase of raw materials and the formation of Leitner Poma. So this, this company that you see, Leitner Poma, this is a new joint venture that has been developed in America. So in America, uh, uh, this is the company that you would come across who does the ropeway systems. So essentially, HTI Group, so as there are two major players. One is the Doppelmayr Group, group or Doppelmayr or Caraventa Group, and the HTI Group, who are the key players in the ropeway systems. And any Indian player who would want to do these ropeway systems to use 3S technology, you would be dealing with one of the subsidiary companies of these. And I'll give you the example of the recently awarded uh, ropeway system in Varanasi and how that company belongs to one of these groups. Now, uh, the status of ropeways in India, right? So you must have come across this company, National Highways Logistics Management Limited, NH. Uh, LML. So this is a new uh, company that has been formed as a subsidiary of NHAI, National Highways Authority of India, which is responsible for logistics development in the country, including ropeways. So they are doing multimodal logistics parks as well, a lot of other logistic uh, pro, uh, procurement, including ropeways. Uh, this is a central government uh, uh, agency under NHAI. Now, some of the envisaged facilities for ropeway PPPs projects in India are listed here. So, of course, boarding, deboarding, waiting lounge, clock room, commercial space. That's a key element. So, in the across the RFPs, you would see now there's a provision of commercial space as well that the private sector can use. Medical facility, backup power, and Wi-Fi facility. And uh, initially, uh, when the ropeway PPP procurement started in India, a lot of the states went out and uh, uh, start tried procuring these systems on their own under different models like BOT model or EPCC model, but they were not very successful. So now uh, a lot of the states like uh, Arunachal, Andhra Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, 
Uttar Pradesh, Odisha, a lot of these states have now signed MOUs with uh, uh, the highway uh, NHLML, uh, the logistics company, uh, to help them in procurement in procurement of these systems. And all these procurements are now being done under hybrid annuity model or the HAM model, which was a very good success in the road sector in India. So a very similar model is being followed for rope PPPs as well, although there are some differences that will go uh, in detail in the next section. OK. Uh, right, so in terms of projects, so what you see on the slide is a list of 18 projects uh, that have been proposed as of now uh, by NHLML. Uh, one of them, the the first project that you see, Varanasi Kant to Godolia Chalk uh, in uh, Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh, that has already been awarded for 3.85 kilometers. Uh, this is the case study for today, so I think in the later part of the presentation, we will talk about some more details about how that project was awarded, what was the cycle, what was the procurement timeline, uh, who were the bidders, etc. And then uh, the three other projects, uh, Gorikand, Govindnath, and uh, Ujjain railway station to Mahakal. So these projects are under procurement right now. So if you go to the uh, in procurement department, you would find these questions, these uh, projects. And then uh, the other projects uh, which are under development are serial number five to serial number 18. So approximately right now, total 18 projects are in different stages across India uh, with a total of 89.71 uh, kilometer length. Uh, then what is the contractual structure around? Uh, so uh, this really talks about the three key models that you would have for construction of rope PPP projects. Uh, now, hybrid annuitary model was introduced, uh, has been introduced for rope PPPs now based on the success of PPP projects in the road sector. So as I mentioned that uh, it was introduced uh, in 2015, this new model for road sector. In the past six years, more than 250 projects have been awarded in the road sector. And now this model has now been adopted for rope PPPs as well. Uh, what you see in the figure are essentially three models. One is EPC. So a very traditional way of procurement, wherein uh, these projects are, are awarded with full payment by government authority for roadway construction without any deferred payment mechanism. And the obligations of the EPC contractor are till the commercial operation date, and then the government authority has the responsibility for operation and maintenance of the project. In, in the BOT model, uh, uh, which was earlier adopted by states, uh, essentially the market risk has was given uh, uh, to the private sector in some cases, and for some cases, the private the market risk was taken by the government. But it essentially it was a BOT mechanism wherein the entire financing for the project uh, that was done by the developer. The only recovery mechanism was during the operation period, so the private sector would not receive any amount during the construction period of the project. So uh, a BOT model. Uh, has been widely used for PPPs in road sector, and it can be for the transport sector overall. There are two models. One is with demand risk, meaning uh, the private sector is tasked with the recovery of the user charges and any revenue or any user charges or any tariff payments uh, that are collected for that project, they go direct to the private sector. Wherein on an annuity basis, uh, the payments are made based on the availability of the system uh, by the government to the private sector. However, in both the cases, as you can see, the revenue for the private sector really comes in when the project has emerged, achieved commercial operation. So the entire cost of the project has to be financed uh, by the private sector on its own, uh, either through debt or equity. In, in a hybrid annuity model or HAM model, it's a mix. So especially for ropeways, uh, around 60% of the project cost uh, which was earlier 40% for road sector, but around 60% of the project cost is paid during construction in three, uh, around 10 milestones. And the remaining project cost is paid during the operations as an annuity, 
along with an interest payment as well as well as an ONN payment as well. So the exact components of the payment uh, we will talk about just in the next slide. But yeah, so, so that's how it works. So a part of the construction payment coming in, uh, part of the project payment coming into in the construction phase and the remaining coming in the operation phase. So, so this is how a typical uh, uh, structure would look like uh, for any ROPE PPP SPV. So you would have, uh, first of all, uh, the annuity and ONM payments coming from the government authority. So uh, uh, the off taker, as I mentioned, is NHLML, and the annuity payments are 60% during construction and 40% during operation period. Uh, then there is equity financing coming from developer or shareholders, and there is debt financing coming from lenders. And then there's an EPC contractor and ONM contractor. Here, the ONM contractor also implies the OEM contractor. So as part of the ROFE RFPs, you would see that uh, there is a mandatory MOU or a long-term agreement that you would have to enter uh, with an original equipment manufacturer who would be uh, responsible for the maintenance of the entire project uh, during the project concession period. So, so what are, what are benefits for this ham rope PPPs from a concession perspective? Essentially, uh, it's the uh, funding requirement or the financing that they need to arrange. So, because assume there's a hundred dollar project, right, and the sixty percent during construction is coming during construction back uh, from the from NHML, NHLML to private sector. So, uh, so sixty dollars you don't need to finance as a private sector because it will come from the government. Now, out of the $40 that needs to be financed, if you assume a ratio of 75-25 debt equity, so essentially the only equity requirement is 25% of $40, which is only 10. So that's why uh, overall, uh, you would see a lot more participation in these low-pay PPP projects, provided that they have the right technical MOUs uh, with OEMs, that only 10% of the total project cost is really needed as an equity and the remaining can be arranged either through construction entity and or through a debt financing. So of course, there's a provision for mobilization advance as well. This is very similar to the road PPP project that you would see. Uh, there is a higher right of way availability um, because 90% of the project site or the project land has to be cleared uh, by the government and has to be transferred uh, to be basically that land has to be made free of without any encumbrances before the appointed date or the construction start can happen. So after the concession agreement, there is a certain time wherein the government has to arrange 90% of the land and then only the construction can start. And then you have inflated linked adjustments uh, for the project cost and the annuity payments. Then for the government authority, the, the, the advantage is that they don't, uh, it, it saves money compared to a EPC model wherein they would have to pay the entire 100%. So the 40% can be deferred as an off balance sheet item for a very long term of 15 years. And of course, uh, because the, uh, there are various incentives designed in the concession agreement so that the private sector has an incentive to complete the project much in time and start annuity payments as soon as possible. So there's an early completion bonus as well, etc. So these are these are the parameters which were very similar to who wrote PPP projects in the past. Uh, so yes, the HAM contractor bears the risk uh, for a period of 15 years after project completion. So the asset design and construction expected to be of a much higher quality. Uh, and then a higher asset quality translates as a higher service level for project users. So these are the advantages from a government authority perspective. So uh, coming to how the financial uh, governance or how the bid parameters work for this project and how uh, if uh, the participants in this call, they have been doing road PPP project, then you can relate a lot. But otherwise also, like this is very different from a road PPP project. They have introduced uh, a lot of new parameters have been introduced in the concession agreements. And uh, that's why the cash flow modeling or the financial modeling, as we call it for these projects is different. Uh, compared to road ham projects uh, and due to these new parameters. So in terms of bidding, uh, the developers have to submit three types of items uh, for bidding. One is the bid project cost. So now 
uh, this is the cost of the project, which is assess assessed by the bidder as on bid due date. So uh, what is the cost of various components, the lattice tower, the various cable systems, etc. So what is the total EPC cost plus other charges like operation, or sorry, pre-development, uh, construction insurance, etc. So you have the total project cost. So that is the component for bid project cost correspondingly. So that is one parameter and uh, if the construction period for for example for these projects the construction period can be two years and above easily so two years is a minimum that you would expect but it can be higher as well so then uh, for these projects in case there is an escalation in pricing then of course uh, uh, these uh, this bid project cost is also escalated accordingly so to arrive at a completion cost uh, so this is the essentially bid project cost would refer to the total project cost as estimated by the bidder as on bid due date the second is ONM cost. Now the ONM cost is divided into two parameters. One is the fixed ONM cost and the variable ONM cost. Uh, so the fixed ONM cost is a number which is defined by the bidders as rupees XX per kilo per year. And uh, this is essentially to cover your routine maintenance, periodic maintenance, your uh, as per the OEM contract, our uh, manpower and near the admin charges, which are fixed in nature. So these would not change uh, uh dependent these are not independent of the number of passengers or the usage of the roadway system and the second one is a variable onm cost which is defined as again an amount per thousand passengers per day uh, and this is essentially to cover electricity and fuel costs so as you can see uh for a roadway pvp to operate the system you would need electricity as well right and and the longer duration of hours uh means uh, more passengers and hence there would be more electricity consumption. So although the RFP would have all the project RFP mentioned that the system should be available either around the clock or for certain hours in a day, depending on the location, or uh, typically minimum 16 hours in a day. Uh, this uh, ONM cost covers, uh, reimburses the uh, private sector based on the actual usage of the system. So for example, if the system has been designed for 8,000 passengers. However, uh, the only the usage is in the range of 5000 or so you should you should be paid you would be expected to paid in a lower quantum so although this is a hybrid annuity model this is an annuity model but there is an element of the demand risk that the private sector has to bear so that's why uh unlike a road ppp project wherein there is there's actually no demand risk and you get the fixed onm payment here the variable onm cost that is being paid by the authority to private sector is dependent on the usage of the system. So that's why uh, the feasibility studies that have been provided uh, as part of the tender documents, they need to be reviewed in a little bit more detail and some sensitivities would need to be run uh, on that number of passengers to ensure that the bidder has the minimum IRR requirement that it needs as per the hurdle rate. So that is one level of sensitivity that has to be done on the traffic demand or on the uh, passenger uh, count that uses the system. Now, essentially, uh, RFP also says for these green documents, what they also mention is that uh, you would be paid a minimum uh, variable cost ONM. So, in any case, so due to any adversity, for example, or for example, a COVID 19 shutdown, in a scenario wherein there is absolutely no passenger that is using the system. So, still, uh, you would be paid the base amount, which is for 1000 passengers. So if there is a, if only 100 passengers use the system, you, you would still be paid thousand amount for 1,000 passengers. However, if, for example, if it's 1,500 or 2,000, then accordingly, it will be paid on a pro data basis. So 1,500 would be 1.5 times the number that has been quoted. Uh, then there is also a provision for capacity augmentation cost uh, for uh, that has to be quoted for fifth and 10th year. So, so now essentially what it means is that, so. The project life, as you can see, is for 15 years. Uh, what you can partially think about capacity augmentation, the parlance in road, with road PPP project would be major maintenance cost. So in road PPP project, which the ma major maintenance, whatever you have to do is, a, is mandatory and is part of the ONM cost price that you quote for the projects. Whereas for, for these, uh, for roadway PPP, the capacity augmentation is optional. So uh, what the, the, the authority has provided a schedule B as part of the uh, documents wherein they have given an indicative capacity augmentation plan. 
So for example, right now the system is designed for 8,000. So in fifth year, it can be increased to 10,000 and then in 10th year, it can be increased to 12,000. So there's a capacity augmentation of 2,000 or two, every five years. Now, so assuming that capacity augmentation, uh, bidders have to calculate the cost and then provide that as a separate item in the bid parameter. And this capacity augmentation is optional. Uh, so authority can tell you whether you want to do this or not. And the timing is also optional to the authority. So for example, if you code the capacity for fifth year, authority has the option to ask the private sector to do this either in anywhere from third to seventh year. So plus minus two years. So essentially the fifth year augmentation can be done starting in third year as well demand depending on if this demand is quite high or it can be done as seventh year as well. However, the bidders are not allowed to change that quote. So that quote has already been fixed uh, by the uh, uh, as per the tender documents, right? You would be provided the price indexation on that depending on the actual years, but then the base amount cannot change. So this base amount essentially should cover all the uh, capacity enhancement related costs. Like for example, if you need to initial EPC, if you need to do additional roof base, if you need to do additional cable cars. So whatever that cost is for the equipment as well as construction, that needs to be combined into a single number for capacity augmentation, and that's a part of the bid submission. Again, all the values that have to be submitted are exclusive of GST, uh, meaning uh, there is a, uh, uh, GST would be reimbursed separately by uh, the authority uh, based on the actual prevalent rates. So this is the bid submission part. Now in terms of bid evaluation, uh, the bid price, so there's a competition for a bid price that is done by the authority and that the bidder which has the lowest bid price gets the bid. So how that bid price is done, evaluation is done, it's based on net present value of the three components. So NPV of bid project cost, NPV of fixed and variable O&M cost, and NPV of capacity augmentation cost. So for this NPV calculation, the authority would use the design system. So in the bid Excel sheet, it mentioned that what capacity they would be using, either 6,000 or 8,000 uh, passengers per, per year. Uh, so that, that is a system, uh, that is the capacity that will be defined in the bid Excel, and uh, with which this factor of will be multiplied uh, to calculate the actual cost for the authority. And all these values uh, uh, would be discounted using a discount rate which is equivalent to MCR of top five commercial banks plus 1.25 percent again this rate is defined at the time of bid submission and the lowest discounted value would be the winning bid so the lowest bidder is a selected bidder uh, th there are a lot more details about how these project costs are paid uh, uh, we have not covered that in that session due to the time constraint but just to give a very brief overview during the construction period, uh, as it was mentioned, that 60% of the project cost would be paid. Now, this would be paid over a period of over uh, 10 milestones, 10 equal milestones of 6% each. Uh, and these 10 milestones are against uh, a certain percentage of the project completion. So, for example, again, 6% of the project completion, you get the first 6%. Again, against 13%, you get the next 6%. Then against 20%, you get the next 6%. So 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So again, each of these project completion percentages, you will get the 6% of the project cost, so making a total of 60%. And the remaining 40%, of course, is paid during the uh, uh, concession period of 15, uh, the remaining, the operation period of 15 years in 30 equal, 30 equal installments. Not equal, sorry, 30 uh, into. Into 30 uh, installments. Uh, and the O&M payments that are being made, O&M payments are made on a quarterly basis. So uh, uh, the, the invoices for both fixed and O&M costs can be raised on a quarterly basis and the authority would reimburse that. Capacity augmentation, as the name suggests, it will be paid as and when the capacity augmentation is directed by the authority and uh, the work is performed by the private sector. So uh, this slide uh, talks a little bit about the comparative analysis of uh, financial modeling or financial advisory for rope versus four PPP projects. So if you are doing uh, uh, projects 
road PPP project. What are the key things that are different from a typical road PPP project? So number one, that uh, all the calculations that have to be done for such projects should be on a quarterly basis. Uh, uh, as you can infer, the primary reason being that uh, these projects, the payments for ONM are on a quarterly basis. So for more accuracy, it's better to do on a quarterly basis. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned before, the variable ONM cost, uh, this is a variable component in your revenue side, which is dependent on the traffic or the passengers that the system carries. And so certain sensitivities need to be built around this parameter, uh, which uh, was which is not the case for road PPP projects because it's a fixed ONM payment. Uh, similarly, capacity augmentation. So as I mentioned, there's a four year period, four year block. So the fifth year capacity augmentation can be done anywhere from third to seventh. Similarly, the 10th year can be done anywhere from eighth to twelfth. So in reality, uh, you would not, you no one can guess that in which exact year this capacity augmentation would take place. But essentially the financial modeling exercise that you do or the feasibility exercise that you do should ensure that if the capacity augmentation happens in third year or in seventh year, you are covered for your hurdle rate. So at least the minimum hurdle rate is being met in all the scenarios. So again, uh, the next part is about debt drawdown tranches. So uh, as you can see, right, capacity augmentation, if it's a big cost, if you want to do that construction, you will need to arrange debt again or debt financing again and it is not known in advance right now when that would be incurred so for a road ppp project you know that major maintenance has to be incurred because it's mandatory what is the amount and so accordingly when you arrange debt financing you arrange you uh you 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 start making the major maintenance reserve most of the developers would start making the major maintenance reserve to take care of that major maintenance cost however you can't make any reserves for row for PPP systems because you don't know when that would happen. One way is that okay, you follow the same methodology and do the reserves. However, uh, it means that you would be blocking your cash flows instead of paying out dividend payments and there's no visibility when it could be done. So the second way is that there are debt drawdowns assumed when the capacity augmentation would happen. So basically whenever uh, you are asked to enhance the capacity, you would go out in the market and take a short term debt again for that particular capacity enhancement. So uh, they can be debt drawdown tranches or refinancing that might happen for this, these row of PPP projects and accordingly the financial model should have that capability. So again, separate GST computations so that you can track the GST account input output. Uh, now the GST account is important because it impacts your cash flows uh, more importantly during the construction period wherein you would have to spend the 100% of the capex, whereas you will receive only 60%. So there's a GST amount on the remaining 40% that you would have to pay out as a private developer. Uh, and so that cost, the financing for that also needs to be arranged uh, at, at the project level. Now, uh, for ROFE PPP projects, there is also a concept of partial COD. Uh, so this concept was not is was not the rope road PPP projects. So in partial COD, essentially what means is suppose uh, let's take the case of the Varanasi project that has been tendered out on. So there are five stations in that project. Uh, suppose it's one, two, three, four, five, right? So like there's different sections that you would consider. Now if the if the authority says based on the progress of the work that you operate section three to four and four to five. Right, so you're operating partial sections, whereas the entire system is not yet complete, but you have started operation for a partial section. So that's called a partial COD, right? Now this is possible only in a ropeway. This is not this is not possible in a road PPP project because a road has to have a start and an end. So if the starting sections is not done, then the road is not complete. Whereas for a ropeway, in case three stations are complete, then you can still start operating the system. So this is called a partial COD. So in case of partial COD, essentially what you would get 
from the government, uh, you would have received some sort of construction annuity already, depending depending on uh, what, what is that percentage of partial COD to the overall project. And you would also start receiving the ONM payments once you start operating. However, the, the fixed annuity, the operation annuity, uh, can will be disbursed by the authority only if the entire project has reached COD. So what this means is that in case of partial COD, only if you have operated two sections out of the five sections in a row for PPP, you can still start earning uh, the ONM payments, but the annuity payments, operation annuity payments get stuck. Similarly, the interest on those annuity payments also get stuck, and this can have a negative impact in your cash flow because you you might have to start doing debt repayments during that year for some reason. So so essentially, uh, this is something that needs to be kept in mind while you do the financial feasibility for project because what happens in case of a partial COD scenario? So are you able to uh, still recover your cash flows? Most likely it will be a positive development because the partial COD is expected to be much before the is, is expected during the construction period itself. Uh, so it essentially means that during the construction period, besides annuity, you are having additional cash flows of ONM as well. Uh, however, in a in a in an opposite scenario, wherein the because of a certain section uh, not being completed, you're not able to achieve the complete COD, and that has that is delaying your operation annuity payments as well. Then in that scenario, you would be adversely affected in terms of your debt repayments. Again, there are new costs in terms of operation costs that need to be kept in mind, like the long term OEM contract. So it's a, it's a mandatory requirement for these projects. The OEM contract has to be signed uh, for these projects. And also there's a new revenue item as well, which is the commercial activity. So for across all the ROPE PV projects, whatever is the station, whatever stations that you design, uh, you the bidders or the private sector is free to design a commercial space there as well uh, and any revenue that is accruing to the developer because of that commercial space uh, that has to be uh, submitted to the authority but there is no revenue share mechanism so depending on the project so for example for the for the projects which have been tendered till now it says that the revenue share is nil meaning that you have to report to the authority that how much revenue you're earning from the commercial activities but essentially you don't have to share any revenue so that's a new revenue source for uh, the private sector, and that is a positive impact on cash flows, and hence it can give you higher returns. And of course, for roadway PPP projects, because these are mostly in the tourist destination, uh, in hilly terrains, uh, so there is a wide, very high likelihood for this third-party revenue uh, coming to the private sector. Uh, yeah. So the other part, the last part being. Uh, the accounting considerations for these projects. So uh, similar to road PPP projects, these projects would also follow uh, the NDS 115 or the transaction price allocation mechanism, wherein uh, both the construction of the entire project, the construction for the capacity augmentation, as well as the ONM for the entire project would be considered as a single project. And then the transaction price have to be allocated. Now, this is more important in a case wherein uh, uh, the bid up bid project cost is higher than the pro is higher than the actual project cost, meaning uh, some of the part of the O&M, the major maintenance or the capacity augmentation is also being loaded on the bid project cost. So uh, uh, in that case, this is important. Uh, as you may all be aware now, these component wise bid is not allowed for road PPP projects. Now it's a single bid that is being asked for road PPP projects. So there's a possibility in future for road free projects also maybe once certain projects have been tendered out, you would see that uh, these different bids, the different bid, param bid parameters might go away and there's a single bid project cost as well. However, uh, because road free systems have a component of the market risk because it's a usage based system, electricity usage is dependent on the capacity so there's an element of the market risk and also the capacity augmentation is not always the case it's not mandatory because it's again dependent on the demand for that roadway system so i think because of these two factors it will take some time for the government also to devise a mechanism that will 
that will have a single bit parameter. So I think at least for the initial 18 projects that have been notified, uh, these three bit parameters in terms of bit project cost, uh, the ONM cost and the capacity augmentation cost will continue. Um, so, so this is the financial modeling, how it looks like. So these are some of the snapshots. Uh, we would be making uh, the recording available to uh, all the participants, those who have registered. So you can see this later as well. So these are some of the snapshots that you should have in the uh, financial model. Uh, and, and why this is important, the financial modeling exercise is because Article 35 of the concession agreement uh, talks about protection on NPV in case of change in law. So, for example, if there's any change in law from the authority side, this financial model would be the tool uh, that would be used to ensure that the, uh, the reimbursement to the private sector uh, is such that the original NPV is restored. So that's why a robust financial model is necessary for these projects to be submitted to the uh, authority. Then uh, uh, we have 10 minutes left, so we'll very quickly go through the case study uh, before we end this session. So this is an important case study to talk about uh, a recent ham project that was tendered out and was awarded. Uh, the project name is uh, Varanasi Kaun to uh, Godolia Chop. This is the first project out of that 18 project list I talked about. And, and this project went through a long procurement phase because the it was tendered multiple times and finally awarded in the third time of the tender. So, so let's look at how it went. So in August 21, uh, the, there was a first announcement of this ropeway PPP project and the feasibility study was prepared by rights. That was in August 21. Uh, and in November 21, when the pre-bid meeting happened, there were seven Indian and foreign companies who attended this mod meeting. And earlier it was on a BOT basis. So this project was initially thought uh, by the UP government uh, on a BOT basis. So, however, even the, there was good interest in the market, but there were no bids. No bids were received for the first round. So then in May 2022, uh, the UP government then worked with the uh, NL MHL, the, uh, the subsidiary, and then uh, the NHA subsidiary, and then it was the project implementation model was changed to HAM. Uh, so it, this project was the standard was done again and uh, there were two proposals that were received however one of them was technically disqualified so again because there was single bidder uh, left so the project could not be awarded so then in august 2022 uh, the tender was floated again the third time and then in the three bids uh, that were received in november 2022 in december the project evaluation was completed and then uh, even the evaluation project for this uh, evaluation process for this project was done in two stages uh, because in the in the initial stage of evaluation of technical evaluation all the three bidders were passed but then uh, one of the bidders were later disqualified from bidding for any NHI projects and then for one year and then again the evaluation was done so there were two bidders left and the project was then awarded to one of the bidders. So, so this is the entire timeline. So it took the entire project procurement uh, since preparation was almost two years for this project. Uh, and these are some of the highlights of uh, the project. So the cost is around 18, 815 crores. Uh, there were three bids received. So uh, GR Infra projects, uh, Gava Construction and uh, Wish for Samudra Engineering. Uh, the GR Infra projects was later disqualified at the technical stage round two evaluation uh, and Gavar and Vishwa went to the financial opening stage wherein the bid from Vishwa was the opening bid, uh, was the winning bid. So, so the COD uh, is for this project is expected to be in May 2025 and appointed date in May 2023. Now the technology partner or the OEM Remember, we talked about in the earlier section of the presentation that there are four people. So there are two major groups. One is HDI group and one is Doppelmayr. So for this project, for this project, the technology partner is a German company called uh, Bartholet Masiniabu. Uh, now, this Bartholet uh, 
is again a part of the HDI group, which already owns Puma and Leitner as well. So all the three companies, Puma, Leitner and Bartholet, they are all part of the same HDI group. And they this is the first project that, that now they're doing in India in collaboration with Vishwa Samudra. So um, this project has the base capacity of 3000 PPHPD. Uh, total operation time, as I said, around 16 hours in a day. Uh, approximately 96,000 passengers will be will be carried per day in both directions. Total 153 gondolas or cabins, as we call it, to be deployed, and each gondola would have a capacity of around 10 passengers. Uh, so the total stations would be five stations, and uh, out of the total five stations, one of the station. Uh, and uh, I think it's Garji Chalk, or th th there's some name wherein this station is not meant for boarding, deboarding. It is just a connecting station to put in the lattice tower, but essentially it, the boarding and deboarding will not be allowed. So there are only four stations wherein passengers can board and deboard the gondolas. And there are total 30 lattice towers that will be prepared, for, made for this project, height varying from 10 to 15 meters, depending on 10 to 55 meters, depending on the location. So uh, th this is a kind of an overall all view of the project itself. And um, as you can see, as, as I mentioned earlier, that this project went two stages of technical evaluation. So uh, the one that was done in October when the bids were received. So in October, um, uh, the initial evaluation, all the three parties, GR Infra, Gavan and Vishwa Samudra, all these three were technically qualified, as you can see here. Uh, but then when the evaluation again happened in on 9th November, so which was the final result of technical bids. So then you can see that uh, GR Infra projects was disqualified uh, due to debarment of the firm by uh, MORTH for a period of one month. So because this order was passed on 8th of November, uh, so this evaluation was done again, and then uh, one of the companies was taken out. So there were two companies and out of which uh, Vishwa Samudra was then awarded the project. So uh, this this was the case study that uh, we want to discuss today. And yeah, uh, that that's that's the uh, end of the masterclass. So uh, if, if you have any questions regarding uh, what we discussed today, you can please send them to uh, info at yoginfra.com. Uh, uh, we will just reply back to you via email uh, uh, on those questions. And uh, we will also send you the recording for this session uh, to all the registered participants, uh, even if they're not being able to attend the class uh, via your registered email ID. OK, uh, so thank you again, everyone, for your valuable time for attending the class today.